What's up world? So in this video, I'm going to talk about everything you need to know going into season 24 as a demon hunter man. <laughs> Bro, you gotta be kidding me, man. There's no demon hunter changes next season, man. I'm like next pass, like what are you doing? Now you wanna make a full demon hunter guy? Where were you like a couple of years ago? I'm not gonna watch this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's true. However, with the new season coming up, season 24 with the Ethereals, Demon Hunters gets one of the best Ethereals in the game in the form of a Bariza. This Bariza allows us to do even more efficient solo speed runs, also puts us back on the map in terms of doing group speed runs outside of doing a ZDH. And I've also been asked several times to do more guides pertaining to Demon Hunters and things like that. So this is my first shot at something I guess called uh, everything you need to know about Demon Hunter season, whatever. Wait, hold up. So you saying I can bring my DPS Demon Hunter into a group next season? You got some room in your group? Maybe. Question is, will you play nicely? <laughs> no. As expected. For all you Demon Hunter mains out there, there's a tips and tricks section at the very end of the video, which helped me snag rank 1 several times the past few seasons, and hopefully it will up your Demon Hunter game too. Hope you guys enjoy the video. So season 24, our starting set is actually Natalia 6. Uh, there's quite a few pieces that can kind of go along with it and which you can kind of put together to, to do things with. And <laughs> let me just be honest, like you just need to skip this set all together. It's the worst starting set for Demon Hunters. Um, I try to find something positive to say about it, but really there isn't. You just need to get out of this and get to using God 6 ASAP. Every class gets three ethereals a piece. And for Demon Hunters, we get all bows. Unfortunately, if you like Impale or, well, really Shadow Impale, um, you're kind of out of luck because there is no melee weapon that you can use to take advantage of that. So it's kind of unfortunate. In terms of uh, uh, God 6 is concerned, uh, you have to pick between three different ones. You have the Bariza Ethereal, the Wind Forest, as well as the Doom Slinger. Uh, I'm here to tell you that the Bariza is by far the better ethereal to use with god six than the others um most of it is just because it's just way more damage um it has extra cold damage it also has crit on freeze we'll talk about that a little bit later it's just a better weapon overall than the others that you can possibly get um the wind force is really not bad you will want to use that for you know multi-shot related builds um as well as some cluster arrow as well if you want to go that route um the doom slinger as it is the weakest weapon of the three uh, it actually does kind of have its place and a lot of it has to do with this extra fix basically um movement speed upon killing elites uh for seven seconds which actually makes this particular weapon the best t16 farming um weapon for the demon hunter arsenal at this point uh, you actually want to stick a ruby in there because the ruby actually gives you more damage than the emerald does Which kind of brings us back to our, you know, vanilla days of d3. So it's really cool to see the ruby uh, Having a use here uh, So for t16 bounties and key farming doom slinger is in my opinion the best weapon to use for that uh, Bariza is going to be the best for any guy six related builds and even though, you know Bariza is by far the best whatever you find first um, as you are leveling up through the season, it's going to be the one that you use first. So if you find a wind force first, then you're probably going to use that first um, and whatnot until you're able to uh, get up to the to the to the Bariza and things like that. So yeah, Bariza all the way for sure. So in terms of legendary fixes that we can kind of get on the Bariza, um, there's only 
three really that kind of comes to mind that's going to be useful for you as a uh, god six user uh, and that's going to be to your left you got the valas fortress in the middle and you have the uh dawn for the most part to the right and i already know what you're thinking the obvious answer for most of you would be oh well just put on some valas and be done with it right like that's like, that's the best of fix right well no, not really. It's actually not nearly as good as it has been in the past. And it has a lot to do with really just understanding um, why Volus was good in the first place. Using one hand in quiver or dual wielding initially puts you at the seventh frame breakpoint. This is the second worst breakpoint to be at behind the eighth frame, giving you roughly 4.2 projectiles a second on average. Since the consistent max projectile spawn is possible is 6.5 a second at the nine frame breakpoint, which is actually the best breakpoint, there's room for things like Rocket Storm and the Volus Piercing mechanic to help fill in the gap, quote unquote. While Rocket Storm is decent at doing so, so is the Volus Piercing mechanic that practically emulates the nine frame breakpoint when surrounded by density, regardless of what inefficient breakpoint you may be at. It is this combined with the extra stat that Valus rolls with that gives you roughly a one and a half to two GR uh, advantage over the other weapon combinations using the same weapon type. Now that we're all using two hand X bows for season 24 and attack speed comes baked in with the Bereza Ethereal, we'll hit the nine frame breakpoint naturally without having to add or subtract any attack speed. This gives the the piercing mechanic from Vala is little to no room to possibly proc additional projectiles since you're already at the best possible breakpoint. Even then, running Rocket Storm can take care of those rare gaps. Couple this with the fact that the Pierce Cap nerf causes us to gather less density than before, and the Vala's legendary fix has considerably less value than it did before. It's not even worth a GR's worth of damage potential, which means it's not something that you're going to even notice. Now, if you get a nice ethereal Bereza and it rolls the Vala fix, then sure, go for it. But if this isn't something that I would seek out as there are better options available. I will honestly go for the Fortress of Fix because that's going to give you the most versatility uh, versus the other options. Uh, mainly being because of the fact that obviously it's a shield, so you get more defense and more, um, more sustain, uh, much larger sustain, really. And if you can keep up like one or two more stacks of squirts because you're using a fortress, you already um, have toppled the benefit of using the Vala's uh, legendary fix already. So, and if you're a good player, you can probably squeeze out a few more stacks of squirts on average uh, per rip, making this significantly better offensively and defensively. Um, not to mention that because of the fact that the Bereza, you know, also has the crit on freeze um, a fix and a 35% chance to do so, um, uh, to freeze, sorry, a 35% chance to freeze, um, you can actually kind of sacrifice, a, you know, a couple of crit chance rolls or, or, you know, places in which it's hard to roll crit chance or roll the perfect fixes like AKA a quiver. Um, and you're not going to really notice much of a hit there. I'll talk more about that later. Um, but you can swap it out for vitality, you know, for some light percent and kind of really, you know, beef up the shield a little bit more. So therefore you can keep it up a, a little bit longer. Uh, the the uh, square stacks, I mean, if you go to the right, you have your Dawn. Um, if you get super lucky and get like a 64% or higher Dawn, um, then you would want to go with that, obviously, because then that means that gives you the most flexibilities in terms of options, um, such as putting Odyssey's in the cube or putting Leon in the cube. And I didn't really put those options up here just because of the fact that there's a bug between uh, switching generators and things like that right now. So um, that's why I don't recommend Odyssey's in or Leonine's until that bug is fixed because that bug's can pretty much cause you to, you know, ruin the, um, just the play style of the builds itself. So that's why I'm not really talking about it. Uh, but in terms of passives is concerned, you, for the most part are, are going to go with your main three, right? So ambush, cold of the week, numbing traps is going to, for the most part, be a given on, on any, uh, of your build options. Um, the fourth passive obviously is for the most part, whatever you want. I choose steady aim because of the way I play. We'll talk about that more later, uh, but you'll kind of see awareness here and some other stuff in this slot. But in terms of a fifth passive to put on your Bereza or to search for for your Bereza uh, would be archery. And I know that 
kind of probably sounds a little crazy because it's like, oh, it's only 50% crit damage. But with the fact that we're now critting more than we used to due to the Bereza affix, um, crit damage has more value than it used to because obviously the more you crit, the better crit damage becomes. So this is gonna become a passive that's gonna be for the most part, you know, almost a must um, seek after passive. Um, you might see some people try to go with singled out I wouldn't suggest that just of course like i said you know if you if you are building to freeze a lot this is going to become watered down quite a bit um so yeah so when it comes to solo guy speeds there's two different options you can go with we have the standard guy six setup and we also have the augios variant uh both options will for the most part achieve similar results uh but i uh, do know that the Agios variant is slightly better because it's going to achieve more consistent results because its damage is more consistent um, at the cost of being a bit squishier than the standard setup. So if you're going to run with the Agios version, just be you know well aware that you're probably going to drop your squares uh, more often in, in this case scenario. However, I was able to achieve on PTR, uh, GR 125s in under three minutes with both setups. Uh, when it comes to playing with the Agios variant, you kind of want to kill everything on the way. Uh, but when it comes to playing with the standard setup, you want to put yourself in situations where your cold cycle is happening roughly when you're around elite pack. So you kind of want to go more so elite hunting with the standard variant, whereas with Agios, you will want to try to kill everything on the way. In terms of skills, for the most part, uh, four of them are going to remain the same, almost no matter really what you do. You're gonna have the hunger and arrow, devouring and arrow, which is the cold, the cold room. You're gonna run with strafe. Uh, you can go between rocket storm and or drift and shadow. Uh, it's really a preference up to you at that point uh, for speeds. Um, you're gonna run uh, vengeance dark heart. That's gonna be a standard and a fan eyes blade of armor for for defense. But the two different skills that you can kind of play around with would be the, uh, for the most part, um, this middle portion here. So I tend to like shadow power. Uh, I generally choose that over smoke screen for both my speeds and pushing. Um, again, personal preference. I don't really think one is really better than the other. It's just more so of uh, what you're most comfortable with. I like gloom. Um, just so therefore I can pop it whenever I want to kind of keep my fortress uh, shield up with my ethereal. Um, however, for the second slot, I like to run wolf so I can get just a little bit more damage um, um, in that sense and things like that. But uh, popular options are also smoke screen uh, with preparation for a primer, you know, smoke screen spam or even shadow power gloom with preparation for a perma shadow power spam here too as well. Um, Boar is also an option for some more defense. Um, again, really, this is all really just preference, you know, for the most part, what you're comfortable with, whatever you choose to run um, here is entirely up to you. Um, when it comes to passives, like I said before, earlier in the video, um, you're gonna have your standard three, as always, your cold of the week, numbing traps and ambush. Uh, I prefer steady aim here because again, with speeds, you're really not, you know, trying to, come close or come in contact with the mob. So steady aim gets, you know, really good value here. And of course with the archery, hopefully being the fifth passive on your Bereza Ethereal, um, you'll have all the damage necessary to be able to do uh, speeds relatively quick. For gems, you're pretty much gonna keep two of them the exact same as you would for most of your setups. And that is going to be Simplicity Strength and also the take gym. gem. Uh, the third gym is gonna be probably more of a controversial statement here. And I, I, I'll kind of explain more in my tips and tricks section about this third gym. Uh, but for speeds, Zyze is pretty much the best third gym you can run um, for solo speeds. Uh, you can replace it with, with uh, Trapped. Um, but the thing about it uh, with trap is that you're not going to be able to activate trap consistently um, without kind of being a little bit close or relying on the freeze proc or relying on your uh, your follower. And when you're talking about speeds, you really don't have time uh, for those things to kind of happen, you know. So with Zyz, you know, you pretty much get your damage immediately at the time so you know you're you're moving around and things like that and from the furthest distance you're getting its maximum damage bonus which means that you're chunking off um uh, a good bit of health with with the ambush passive um upon seeing these enemies on the screen uh so this makes Zai's 
quite a bit better um, than the uh, than the than the trap alternative. Again, not saying you can't run trap, just saying that Zai's is uh, arguably arguably better uh, for this case scenario. The thing you kind of want to think about though is um, whether or not you want to commit to leveling up a Zai's gem. Um, for that purpose, because you may or may not use it for a push scenario. And that kind of goes the same thing with, with all guilds too as well. It's one of those things where it's like, do you really want to commit to um, finding a good pair of all guilds, you know, to run just for solo speeds? And if you're maining a demon hunter, um, most likely the answer is yes. Um, but yeah, I would definitely consider Zeiss as the best gem for solo speeds. When it comes to group speeds, uh, not too much really changes except for uh, maybe the option to run preparation. In this case scenario, you're gonna want to um, over doing a pet just simply because the ZDH is going to have a pet of some sort. Um, other than that, um, you're gonna always be running with a ZDH of some sort, which has the Odyssey's end buff and that buff is additive. And because that buff is additive, it also is additive to uh, your third gym, Taeguk, okay? Um, with that being said, this means that you actually wanna swap out your Taeguk for a different gym because, you know, otherwise your, your damage buff from Taeguk would be so watered down by the Odysseys that it's really not gonna be worth it. So the three gems you really wanna shoot for in this case scenario would be the Simplicity Strength, Trap, and Zyze. What I do want to talk about, though, is the fact that this that the new Bereza actually makes or puts uh, Demon Hunters kind of back on the map when it comes to uh, when it comes to group speeds. Um, no longer are we going to be uh, delegated to just the ZDH roll for speeds. Uh, God Six can actually replace um, pretty much any of the damage dealers um, for your for your typical um, speed runs, except for Ras. You probably don't want a demon hunter uh, in place of one of the rat necros but in terms of uh replacing a monk or a firebird wizard um deep god six demon hunter is a solid choice um as a damage dealer for speeds um i would actually probably recommend more so that uh demon hunters kind of stay in the demon hunter party um rather than replacing uh, a different DPS in a different party, main, mainly because uh, with the Berezia effect, the chance to crit on freeze and being able to freeze, the more demon hunters you have in your party, the, the uh, more convenient your freeze becomes. Um, so having two demon hunters or two really good uh, and well geared demon hunters together um, in a party with the ZDH um, is going to be really good for uh, for group speeds. Um, so two God six ZDH and a, and a Z bar will actually do pretty well together. Um, I will even go as far as saying three God six demon hunters, um, with one ZDH with running with standard God six. So basically in this particular setup, you will actually want to do, um, the standard in, in, in which you run condition of elements, but you want to desync your, uh, Condition of elements. So therefore, each one of the God Six Demon Hunters, you know, has their cold cycle on a different four second time frame. And if you do this correctly with uh, three decent players that can kind of keep up their squirts, you know, relatively well with the ZDH, and you're looking at um, uh, XP gains that will be fairly close to Firebird runs and or Monk runs. So I'm actually pretty excited to kind of try that out because I think that that's going to be kind of like the underdog setup, setup that people aren't really expecting to do too well with. So hopefully I'll be able to showcase this in season 24 since most of my clans are Demon Hunter mains. So now we're talking about Push God 6. And to be honest with you, there really isn't that big of a difference between your speed setup and your God six push setups. Um, only thing that you might really consider more so obviously would be less speed options. You might not want to run tactical advantage here, obviously. Uh, Drifting Shadow is something that you may not want to go for in terms of your strafe rune. Uh, Rocket Storm is going to be significantly better here, um, especially if you're strafe uh, weaving quite a bit. More on that later. Um, but mostly you can run with standard God six and, e and you can even push with all guilds. I know that that, that seems criminal to do so, um, but I've actually achieved uh, several rank one clears using both 
uh, variations uh, with it. And you can totally do it with all guilds if you really don't like Convention of Elements. Um, however, just note that, again, you're going to be really squishy and uh, you're going to want to make sure that you stack a lot of physical resist um, as, as secondaries on many different pieces of gear if you want to survive. Uh, but it is possible, so I don't want to tell anyone that it's not, so it's completely up to you. Um, that is that is your choice. But most players are going to run with the standard setup uh, using convention of elements. If you're playing hardcore, um, you're going to go for uh, the elusive ring instead, and you're definitely going to use the uh, awareness passive and possibly another cheat death from your follower. Um, outside of that, everything for the most part stays pretty much the same here. Um, when you're pushing solo, with this particular build, you don't really want to gather that much trash, especially with the Pierce Cap nerf that we got in the previous patch. Um, you only kind of want to gather just enough that you can handle to where you can also keep up your squirt stacks as long as possible. So um, gathering the entire room uh, is no longer as efficient as it used to be, um, just simply just because we're going to only get four pierces or plus four pierces. Um, no matter how dense the area is. So gathering more mobs than your pierces can actually hit and or your area damage can actually, you know, uh, um, handle isn't going to help your situation a lot. Um, God 6 is definitely better in the one-on-one -on -one case scenario. So like elites by themselves, um, God 6 actually does pretty good with. So that's why I said when you do uh, gather mobs, you don't want to gather too much because you do kind of want to do, or you do kind of want to be in one-on-one -on -one scenarios versus elites because we actually kill them rather quickly uh, with this particular setup. The one thing I will say that is, you know, for the most part unique to this particular season when it comes to pushing is that now that we have the freeze on crit with the Bariza Ethereal, uh, we, you can actually opt for a zero crit chance version of this build. And what you're watching on the screen right now is actually my GR138 clear on PTR, removing all crit chance from all pieces of gear. Um, this setup honestly is only roughly two one and a half two grs behind the standard setup i'm not saying this is something you should opt for but it was something that i just chose to do on the ptr as something you know something to do for fun i actually have a video link of this particular clear down in, in, in any description below uh but what makes this pretty cool in terms of doing what i did is that it basically lets us know that you know crit chance on gear has a has you know less value in terms of pushing grs than it did before due to the bariza ethereal um so places that's kind of hard to get crit chance on such as the quiver and you know probably your amulet if you're missing crit chance there it's really no biggie like you're probably not going to feel it or or recognize that it's missing at all so you can kind of like go for different options on pieces of gear that you probably wouldn't have otherwise and if you're using the four Ballista Legendary Fix for your Bariza Ethereal, which is, in my opinion, the best one to push with, um, then you can opt for things like more vitality and things like that uh, to kind of give you just a little more off on your shield and things like that. So um, again, if things don't roll with crit chance the way that you want, it's not the end of the world, you know, at all. And you can pretty much uh, figure out what's best for you. Maybe on your rings, you might want to just go with cooldown reduction and area damage and um, crit damage and just forego crit chance all together in your rings instead. I mean, that's an option. You can go that route and it's valuable. Um, the one thing I will say is that un unlike the previous patch where I said that the Enchantress was definitely the best follower to use there, in this case scenario, um, I would almost pin it on the Scoundrel this time around. And I know that also kind of sounds kind of silly, but the reason why I say that is because, you know, if you do go the route of um, uh, taking off crit chance on certain pieces of gear, the scoundrel can kind of help out with that with the Night Veil vale ability as well as the 4% crit chance, innate crit chance that he ups gives you. So it can kind of make you further even customize a little bit more in terms of like uh, what stats you may want to go for other than crit chance. Um, not to mention that you can also equip your scoundrel with a Bariza 
the regular Bariza, not the ethereal Bariza. He can't, he can't wear that, but the regular Bariza um, will allow him to also be able to help you with more freeze procs, which will then trigger, you know, your guarantee crit on freeze more often. So I think the scoundrel kind of edges out the enchantress here slightly uh, in this case scenario in terms of flexibility. However, it doesn't mean that the enchantress is bad. Uh, by any means, I just think that the scoundrel is probably slightly better here in this case. Um, but flexibility is there and I think it's going to be great for demon hunters pushing. So when it comes to ZDH, uh, not much has changed. Uh, what you see in the screen is your typical ZDH, uh, setup mainly for, uh, for meta groups for pushing GRs, as well as, uh, some meta groups for some speeds for, for other classes. When it comes to ZDHing for God 6 uh, Demon Hunter groups, um, you do have a few different options you can kind of play around with. Uh, the ZDH can run with a Bariza uh, to help with some additional freeze procs of that nature, but it does mean that you kind of have to make up some resource cost reduction elsewhere. Um, another thing that you can think about uh, doing with the ZDH with God 6 is running with the S of John. Uh, versus running with uh, uh, Flavor of Time. And I know that kind of sounds silly to do, uh, but considering that Entangling Shot, especially when it's manually cast, has a uh, pretty nice proc rate, it tends to trigger S of Johan relatively well, uh, which gives God 6, you know, a little bit of pull and, and some area damage without having to like switch back and forth between generators. Uh, not to say that the Leonine Bola's uh, option is, you know, bad, um, it's just that, you know, when it comes to speeds, you pretty much don't really want it to, um, kind of go back and forth between the two generators. If you can, um, if you can help it because you don't want to miss, uh, an entangling shot here to, you know, buff your teammates and stuff like that, because you shot a bullet and stuff like that. So it's just much easier to just stick with entangling shot and get a couple of S of Johan procs and, and just kind of go that way. Much like the ZDH build, um, not much really changes here in terms of T16. And of course there's um, a lot of different varieties and different ways to be able to build a T16 setup. So I'm not gonna kind of go over all the different variations that you can do, uh, but the one major change you will see and that you do see here is that we're using the Doom Slinger instead of the, of the Yangs uh, for, T, for T16 runs. And mainly being is because of the brand new affix that's on the Doom Slinger, where basically after you kill an elite pack or a champion, um, you gain 30% movement speed for seven seconds. And this pretty much makes this particular ethereal have a purpose and a use, um, because it really is, doesn't have much of a use elsewhere outside of maybe some uh, uh, Natalia 6 God 4 uh, setups that you may want to do on the side. Um, but outside of this, I mean, this is the perfect scenario to use a Doom Slinger in. And also it's pretty cool because we can actually equip a ruby. A ruby is actually better than, than the emerald uh, for the first time since way, way back in D3 vanilla. So pretty cool to see here. All right, so about the Zyze gem, there's two things really to talk about. Uh, one thing is uh, a little bit probably more well-known than the other thing, but I'm gonna go ahead and talk about both things here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is that the Zai's damage bonus, the way it's calculated, is not like Steady M. So it's not really based off your character versus, you know, where you are to the mob itself. It's based off of the projectile or the distance between you and your projectile that you shot. So if I'm on top of Tyrio, which I am right now, then basically I'm going to get the first damage uh, tier from material from the projectile, but everything that I hit past that point, the past material is going to get more and more and more damage as the projectile travels. So it doesn't really matter where you are in terms of your body to the mob. It matters where the projectile is uh, to where you are itself. Okay. Uh, the second thing to note too, is that with the Zyze gem here, and this is probably uh, something that's not as well known is that uh, the damage is actually rounded up to the nearest tenth. Okay, what this means is that if you're at one yards, but the projectile between you and the projectile itself is at one yards, you're gonna get the ten yard damage bonus automatically. So it doesn't even matter how close the projectile and you you know are, you're gonna always get the minimum ten yard damage bonus. But the moment that you're at eleven yards you actually get the 20 yard damage bonus at 11 yards. And going further than that, you get 
uh, at 21 yards, you get the 30 yard damage bonus. And at 31 yards, you get the 40 yard damage bonus. And at the 41 yards, you get the 50 yard damage bonus. So I think you can kind of, you know, get where I'm coming from with this. So to get the maximum damage bonus from Zai's, you don't have to be at 50 yards. You really only need to be at 41 yards. And to get an idea of where that's at, um, just look at where I am here. Uh, between Tyrael and this banner, my banner right here is about 41 yards, okay? So it's really not that far if you think about it. And because when you're strafing around and things like that, your arrows are constantly just hitting back and forth, usually for the most part away from you, um, you're getting the 40 yard and 50 yard damage bonuses quite often. And so um, this is actually the reason why I tend to use, or I tend to favor the Zai's gym because you know, I, with the next tip that I'm gonna show you after this, um, I'm able to kind of get the 50 yard damage bonus quite often. Um, so, yeah. So before I get into it, I'm sure after playing this build for a while, you kind of notice that um, the projectiles when you're strafing around by itself uh, tends to be rather inconsistent. Um, it tends to be pretty, sporadic throughout the rift as long as you're moving but of course when you're in the corner and you're strafing standing still you kind of see that streamlined projectile that looks really nice and you're just like man that's quite a bit of projectile that looks pretty cool but then you start moving again you're just like what the hell happened right so what's happening here is that the distance between you and the straight projectile that is, that is traveling changes quite often and oftentimes ends up getting interrupted by the internal cooldown of the ability itself, which may not may or may not proc that projectile when it should, um, leading to very sporadic projectiles as you see on the screen. So the way that we've always alleviated that um, was to basically play on top of the monsters. Well, we, we, we will strafe through them, strafe on top of them. So therefore the strafe projectile itself is as consistent as it can be to spawn the projectiles that it's supposed to. Um, regardless, you end up spawning about 6.5 projectiles at max a second if you're at the nine frame breakpoint or you're using a Valas. However, what if I told you that there's a way to be able to make your projectiles as consistent as you want them to be at any distance on the map and also increase your projectile count per second by 1.3 or 1.5 projectiles. Well, there is a way and it's actually called strafe weaving and I'm going to show you how. Strafe weaving is when you manually cast your generator during your strafe animation, which in turns interrupts your strafe animation and casts a generator. We already do this, but mainly to refresh momentum stacks for damage and speed, as well as to keep our hatred pull up. What you may not know is that every time that you strafe weave, you interrupt and you reset the internal cooldown of the four piece bonus, which allows for a rather consistent stream of projectiles for a very short period of time. It is this in which we can take advantage of to squeeze more projectiles over a, over a set period of time by strafe weaving frame perfect back to back near your attack speed break point. In the video that you see on the screen, each time I strafe weave, you see four projectiles spawn before the next strafe weave happens. Occasionally, if Rocket Storm happens to hit right before my next strafe weave animation, I can even squeeze out a fifth projectile. In order to get these consistent stream of projectiles, you'll have to know the frame window of which to strafe weave to achieve these results. The frames for a two hand expo at the nine frame breakpoint, which is the 1.5 for a normal attack speed breakpoint, is between 32 and 36 frames. Weaving after the 36 frame will result in the internal cooldown, quote unquote, normalizing. And you'll start to lose the advantage of what strafe weave offers, as well as less projectiles per second. What you see in the video shown is me strafe weaving at the 32 break or the 32 frame, 33 frame, and 34 frames. The video itself looks sort of jank uh, because it was actually a private video that I recorded uh, to show Woody Joe and North were as I was showing them how I was doing this. You really want to try to strafe weave as close to the 32 frame as possible, which is near half a second. Doing this will present you between 7.8 to 8 projectiles a second, which is a nice little bump over the 6.5 projectiles a second, which you get from normally strafing around. 
Now, of course, this isn't something you're gonna be doing the entire time. This is more so useful when gathering or after you gathered a bit of things and you know you're gonna be in a specific area for a while when you're pushing. This is something that's going to take some practice getting used to. A good way to get the rhythm down is through solo speeds. I don't mean two minute speeds, but more so three and a half minute to maybe four minute speeds. Doing the slower speeds will give you time to maximize the technique against elites and champions when you come across them. Getting used to this will increase your efficiency over time and then you can take this into your normal three minute speed runs and even group speeds. So another really cool thing about this is that because of the fact that you're in control over your, your projectile count, you can play this at any distance that you want. You're not stuck uh, having to play this up close and things like that. Therefore, it kind of opens up your options in terms of what you may want to do. Um, for instance, for me, this has allowed me to actually play this at mid range, which is why I talked about Zyze earlier, because now I can get a much, I can get more value out of Zyze because I'm actually playing this mid range. Um, couple of this with steady aim, because again, guess what? I'm playing this at mid range. And then also with the squirts necklace, you know, I'll be able to get more squirt stacks up time because again, I'm not in the midst of packs or things like that. And I'm gaining about a good three or four GRs worth of damage advantage here. Um, one of the downfalls though behind doing this though would be, you know, you kind of have to, um, pick and choose when to go to your oculus rings because of course if you're playing at a distance at this point um then if your oculus ring spawns in the middle of a bunch of mobs you kind of have to weigh in uh how much value that oculus ring is going to have if you're already at seven to eight squirt stacks and you're at like a pretty decent distance with zyz already and you got your steady aim up it's usually not even worth it to even travel to even go to the oculus ring because you might just lose your um your squares necklace so it does kind of require a bit more um uh focus to to try to do it this way and this isn't me um trying to talk you into playing this way but more so of you know just letting you know that you have options um rather than just the standard way of doing it. and in even if you do like to go with the trap gym and kind of go for a more normal standard setup being able to apply strafe weaving in general um to to your demon hunter runs is still going to increase your efficiency for solo pushing at least about a good gr gr and a half uh, for you so hope this has helped you all and i'll see you in the sanctuary and that's it i know it's a lot of information but i uh, hope putting them into chapters kind of make it a little bit easier to digest i do plan on doing these series for quite some time hopefully each season uh, so let me know what you think in the comments. Was this helpful to you? And as always, till next time.